I'm going to start with prayer. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a brand new study. It's like opening, cracking open a new book. And there's just so much potential and possibility out there for what we're going to learn. We thank you for this platform, this amazing technology that allows us to be together, to see each other, or you know, pos if possible, to, eat, to hear from each other and to interact and engage. Our goal, Father, is to be in your word. Our goal is to learn from, through the Holy Spirit, guiding us that we would uh, but that we would study to show ourselves approved workmen who need not be ashamed handling accurately the word of truth. So we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for the preservation of your word that we have it. And we thank you that you have given us minds and ability to come together and reason together. So we ask that you will guide our discussion today. Keep us on track. It's There's a lot to cover and try to get um, on this board and to come together in our understanding. Not wrong, but just an understanding. Thank you that you will be guiding us. And we ask and, and just thank you in advance for what we're gonna learn today. And we thank you for it all and ask for it all in Jesus name and for his sake as well. Okay. Of people. Um, and again, hello to those who um, are new to us. We welcome you and are glad you're here. Um, I, and because of that, and even some that have been with me on a couple of studies, I haven't been doing orientation sessions. And so I'm going to spend a very short period of time talking a little bit about what are we doing here? What is this lesson about? What is the precept method? Um, precept Bible study is based on the inductive study method. And inductive means that you are going to the word yourself and you're learning from it. Yes, there's guides. Yes, there's tools. Yes, there's discussion like this where we come together. It's not like you're all on your own, but you can be equipped to take this method and go into any study in the Bible and study that book for yourself. And, and that's just incredibly important. Um, and so um, you can also uh, chat. There's a chat feature in Zoom. And if you have a question, you can chat it in or you can unmute yourself and ask. I will try to keep track of and, and look at that, but I don't always. So you might have to bring my attention to something. But as we study, as we open up this book of 1 Corinthians and you've done your work this week or you tried, <laughs> you, you might have, if you didn't know what you were doing, I've been there. And basically, if you look across everybody here, whether this is their first precept Bible study or they remember their first precept and second and third and whatever precept Bible study, we can all say that we remember a time when we did not know what we were doing. <laughs> and so just answer the questions as you think you should answer the questions as Kay answer, question, asks them in the workbook. Um, if you have other questions, um, I meant to get my How to Study Your Bible book, but there is a book, Three Precept Ministries, called How to Study Your Bible, and it describes the method. So if you were in a question in one of the studies and you really weren't sure what she was asking you to do, you could look at that reference. You can find that on the Precept website, or you can probably buy it you know, from a bookstore or from Amazon or wherever else. I like to buy directly from Precept because it helps the ministry out that much more, it gives more of the money into their pocket. But you can also get it wherever you can find it. Okay, so that's a little bit. So when we do an overview, that's what this lesson is about. This lesson is called an overview. We are not looking at detail. This is the idea of flying really high in an airplane and you can look out and you can see the lay of the land. If you've ever flown out over the like Midwest and you see the patchwork, you know, where farms or whatever. Here in East Tennessee, you're going to see, you're not necessarily going to see the mountain ranges, like you're not going to be able to notice that, but you're going to see the difference in, in waters and trees and plowed fields and roadways. You might not even see that much detail at this level. You're just going to see the overview, and that's the goal. So our goal is to look at all of 1 Corinthians today, through last week in your study and to come together. And I've got this up here that's supposed to kind of look like your at a glance chart that you have in your lesson. 
And if you want to get that out, that would be great. Get out anything in your study. And the thing I don't do is I don't say, look on page four and answer question 1B. That's not how we do this. What we've done is you've done your work. We're coming together to kind of bring it all together. And the other thing I want to tell you is there's not necessarily right or wrong answers. Like whatever I put up on this board is one way to say it, maybe a good way, you may agree with it. Um, but some point my way, <laughs> that doesn't make it right or wrong. But I hope you'll see that there's a few things that we like to take in order to get these like chapter titles. And that's like even taking the words straight from the chapter, rather than making up your own words, take words straight from the chapter that'll help summarize that. And the idea why it's called at a glance is that you could literally take this chart and at a glance, remember what this book was about. Remember what that chapter was about. Remember what that section might've been about, that set of chapters might've been about. and be reminded. So obviously on this, we can't rewrite the text. We can't rewrite every chapter. That's what the Bible is for. Another is in your workbook at the back in the appendix, you have found what we're called observation worksheets. All that is, is the text printed out for you with wide margins and double spacing so that you can write on that. If you're not comfortable writing in your Bible, I am now, but you may not be. And it's kind of nice sometimes to have a clean copy, not something, especially if you have a Bible that has commentary in it. Because in the inductive study method, commentary is the last thing we do. And we, I, if you want to follow the rules, don't look at your commentaries until Kay tells you in the workbook to do it. The idea and the reason for that is so that you have studied rather than listening to someone else prior and going in with a prior thought, a bias, or whatever else. Uh, we all come with bias no matter what because uh, we have backgrounds and certainly we have influence from our past and from our church and all of that. Not all of that's bad, but um, we want to try to take our minds away from that. So if you have a Bible that, if you're reading a Bible that has a lot of commentary in it, it's almost impossible to not read that commentary. So having the observation worksheets are great that you can go to those clean copy, make notes on it, make your list, write on those, do your marking and whatever else, and not do it like directly in your Bible necessarily. But if you want to do it in your Bible, you're welcome to do that as well. Okay, so on your at a glance chart, it talks about the book theme, and it gives each one of the chapters, um, and we're going to write those out. And on this one, it talks about segment divisions with major divisions and problems or topics. So they've given you a little bit of a hint in that sometimes there were lines already drawn to show you some idea of what maybe some of those segment divisions are. It also talks about the author, the keywords, the purpose, the historical setting. Now, whenever we look at a book as a whole, as we're going to do in 1 Corinthians, we can learn straight from the text without going anywhere else a lot about the context, why it was written, who it was written to, and or what was the purpose. In this case, it, we know, and I'm going to start asking questions, 1 Corinthians is what type of literature? Epistle. It's an epistle. epistle. What's, what's a modern day word for epistle? Letter. Letter. Okay. And so in any letter that, because we're all familiar with letters, there are two things that we know about mm -hmm. a letter. And what is that? It's written by somebody and it's going to somebody. Very good. Written from someone going to someone. And that someone either side can be multiple, not necessarily just one person. It can be a group. So in this case, this is an epistle. This is a letter written by who? Paul. Paul. So Paul is the author. And who is it written to? The saints and uh, the believers in Corinth. Right. There's a town called Cor Corinth. 
this is not just written to the city or the town. This is written to the church, the believers in that town. And as you looked through this week, she, you were asked, tell me some things about the Corinthians themselves. What did you learn about them? You found idol worshipers, a lot of them. All right. They had them. Been. And they're still struggling with that, right? They, they came out of idolatry. This is not a Christian town. This is not even a Jewish town. This is a town of completely something else. And, and what else do we know about them? They were infants in Christ. Okay, Paul calls them infants in Christ. That means they're at the beginning stages of their walk with Christianity, right? Okay, who birthed them? Who's their parent? Jesus. Jesus, yes, definitely. I mean, all salvation comes from Jesus through the Holy Spirit. We can't take credit for any of that. But for Paul and the Corinthians, how did he describe their relationship? He was their spiritual father through the he gospel. Was, ab absolutely. He was their spiritual father. That's, uh, in other words, he wasn't necessarily, a, a, he he would say they were brethren, so they're, they're brothers and sisters. Um, they have that relationship, but from a spiritual standpoint, he was the one that went to them. He's the one that started their understanding. He brought the gospel to them. For those of us who have studied Paul in other settings, like in the book of Acts, we saw that Paul's pattern was to go where no one else had been. So he would have done that same thing in Corinth. But we also know in Corinth, there were some other names that were mentioned because they were saying, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. 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 Who else? Cephas. Is that how you say Cephas? that? Yeah, Cephas is most of the time. That would be Peter okay. and Jesus. Okay. Are, is there anything wrong with any of those? No, except for what they were doing with it. Um, all of those are great guys. Uh, Jesus, obviously, is their savior. He didn't go to that town, but he, he is their savior mm -hmm. in them. And then Apollos followed behind Paul in several locations, including this one. So he would have been another of their teachers. And then Cephas, Peter, may have visited there as well. I mean, this could be a different Cephas, but I'm assuming it's the Peter and I could be wrong about that. Um, okay, so they're, they are believers. This is a church. It's in a town or city called Corinth. You can look that up on a map and it is a real place, um, was a real place in, um, in the area. In a, it was a Roman colony. Um, so when this letter was written was after Paul and Apollos had been there, correct? And Cephas and all that after that. So that's one thing that we can know historically about when this letter was written. Also that there is that relationship between Paul and this church. And that um, as, as Sandy said earlier, they had been in idolatry, but idolatry is still a problem in this area. Um, what else, if when you just read through the first time, can you remember what your first impression of this book was? Like what started coming up just as a first impression, just by reading through it? I felt like it was warning us of all the sins that are out there that we could fall, fall into traps and, you know, I don't know just something like that. And that's very good. I mean, because he's he's mentioning those things to them. And that certainly does apply to us today or can apply to us today. Absolutely. Um, when you looked at like if you were writing out what is the purpose as Paul was writing this letter, he talks about various things like that, right? Um, he is, what are some of the other things that you saw as maybe the purpose for Paul writing? Some of the things that just came to the surface um, as you read through. If you had anything, I mean, if there was anything else, because really that's, that's good that it's just that there were all kinds of things he's dealing with, all kinds of topics he's dealing with. They were boasting and arrogant. Very good. And that's part of what, who they were, but it's also part of what Paul's having to deal with, part of the purpose for him writing. You're right. Um, a lot of quarreling. Quarrel. A lot of quarreling. 
Yeah, there's a lot of corals that led to what? Those corals led to when when they're saying I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, it led to division. Yes, right. Um, and so Paul is writing that they would what be of one mind. Yeah. So there's some of it, you see some of these things, even, and again, when we're doing an overview, um, I didn't say this, but when uh, you kind of can see it from the standpoint of like a jigsaw puzzle, if you dumped a jigsaw puzzle pieces out on a table, uh, one of the first things I do is I flip them all over so I can see their colors. And in the process of doing that and pretty much picking up almost every piece, I find what pieces am I gonna find to use first? When you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, do you just pick up a random odd piece and know exactly edges. where it fits? The edges. The edges. Right, you're gonna pick the edges and the corners, uh, which are part of the edges, um, because those are the most obvious. And that's what we're doing here is we're just trying to set those boundaries like with a jigsaw puzzle. We're trying to find the obvious, not details and obscure things yet, because those will start coming to the surface later as we are more and more in this book. Okay, so as you went through your study, we could go ahead and try to come up with a theme because we've done our, our lesson, but we're, instead we're going to uh, kind of a better method is look at the book of a, as a whole, look at its historical context, find out who wrote it, who was it written to, if that's if it's an epistle, and then um, maybe the purpose and like what is said. Not always is the purpose absolutely stated. As John said, I am writing to you. Um, not always is it stated that clearly. Sometimes you have to get it out of what's going on, whatever is being written about. So you see Paul exhorting, appealing, admonishing, warning, um, and uh, responding to what they have written to him. Okay, so those are some of the obvious things. And now let's get a little bit more into the individual book the chapter things. As we do that, remember, again, not right or wrong. I want to be, I want you to not be discouraged if you wrote something down and it's not what I write here. Okay. Don't erase yours because that is what you studied and that is what you got at the time. You might want to also write this down if you choose to, or write it on another piece of paper. You might have, in the beginning, I used to write mine in pencil, but I was tempted to erase it. So don't do that. Um, if you wrote something ex that had nothing to do with that chapter, then that would be quote wrong, <laughs> but not right and wrong as far as good and evil. Um, and I'm not even going to call you out for it being wrong. So don't worry about that. But as you went through, we looked at, well, before even we get to the chapter themes, she had you look at chapters one through six, and then she had you look at chapter seven to 16. If we were just being logical and looked at this book, there are 16 chapters. We might have said, let's look at one to eight and then let's look at nine to 16. But there was a reason and a purpose for her having you go one to six and then seven to 16. Did you discern that? Did you discern why she had you divide it that way? Was there a shift? Was there a change? Was there anything different? Yeah, because I think the first part of it was like more like grace, sanctification. Okay. Stuff like that. And then the second part was more like uh, rules, commandments okay. that we're supposed to obey and stuff like that. Okay, so on your on this part where you've got like major divisions, you might have said one to six was about like grace and sanctification, and you might say the second part was about what you just said, like rules and things to do and ways to to behave and follow, um, and that would not that would not be wrong. That would be a good way of looking at the book in major divisions. Did anybody have anything else? The first part of the book. He is dealing, he, he literally uses the phrases, these things have been reported to me. And the, and I say second half, the second part of the book, he said, these things have been written to me. So there could have been people that came and verbally reported to him. 
either people Paul sent or people that were passing through or this, but there was this, a difference. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the first division are problems reported. And then the second part is he responded or response to things written to him. And it's just, it's, it's just one simple difference in this book. And overall, you can see that like in the second half, it might not be problems. It's just questions they had. You re realize as new Christians, they were living life before and after, and then starting to say, well, wait a minute, what do I do about this? Oh, should I, should I be doing that? Should I not be doing that? You know, and Paul was able to address those things, but it wasn't necessarily problems reported where the first part was about problems being reported. Um, so that's one major division. Sandy had hers, which I liked as well. One was about like how to live, grace, sanctification, this, this after Christianity, after salvation part of your life. And the last part was more detailed, like specific things. Um, that's, that's a good division as well. And then again, Kay gave you a little bit of a hint when she talked about problems or topics <laughs> over there where the major divisions are. And when you started looking at those, um, the first four chapters were talking about like what Sandy, um, Sandy Fankhauser was talking earlier about, they were boasting. They were boasting about a lot of things, but specifically they were boasting in men. And they were, and Paul's talking about how they needed to correct that. And that led to divisions. So I cannot write today. So that's chapters one to four. And then another set of problems or topics that are addressed in five and six is they were tolerating some things. One of the things that in chapter five, what were they tolerating? Immorality. Immorality. Right. And it was very specifically described and told, but they were, the broad topic is they were allowing for and tolerating immorality. And he, he was uh, admonishing them for that. <clears throat> In chapter six, they were allowing what, what else? Lawsuits. Lawsuits, right. And I just wrote in church because we're not worried about how the world performs. We're not worried about what's going on out there. We're worried about what's going on in the church. Okay, so allowing or tolerating immorality in the church and tolerating lawsuits in the church. That's a problem. And that's, these were the problems that were reported, remember, because we finished with chapter six at that point. In chapter seven, what topic does he deal with? What topics or what topic does he deal with in chapter seven? Marriage. Right. He deals with marriage. And also self-control. Yes, self-control and how we have our relationships with each other within that marriage, those marriages. So I'm just gonna put all that under the category of marriage and virgins. Um, he kind of specifically talks about those and gives you know, he just deals with that topic, that, those topics. Um, and in eight, nine, and 10, if you're another division here is, what is he dealing with in those chapters? What's the topic? Idols, sacrificing to idols. And yes, if things, um, specifically if things are in food, 
sacrificed to idols. And you can imagine, again, they're coming out of a time that they used to be idolaters. It was part of their life. It's still all around them. And they would have asked, what do we do about this? How do we, how do we handle this? Okay, in chapter 11, what does he deal with there? I'm sorry, I heard more than one person. The Lord's Supper. The, the, la the second topic is the Lord's Supper. What is the first topic he deals with in that chapter? Abuse and freedom of worship. That's a good way of putting it. Um, yeah. Uh, false prophets. Like prophets, uh, imitators. Okay. Um, in the in the okay. Well, he's saying being imitator of him, um, as I am also of Christ. And then he starts talking about kind of order. How Jesus is the head of the church. The man is the head of the family. The or the head of the household. The wife is supposed to have her hair covered. Uh, it's it. We'll get to this when we study this chapter. So just hang on. And then um, as it comes through that, it also goes into the Lord's Supper. And this is a passage. It's very familiar because it's probably read many many times in many churches during our our practice of taking the Lord's Supper or communion. Um, and so to put just one word to all of these, which isn't, this is, I'm gonna break my rule, it's really not a word necessarily in here, is these are like traditions. These are things, the practices or traditions and things that were going on and would be going on in the churches. So I'm just gonna put traditions here, or you could put practices. And then in chapters 12, 13, and 14, what overall big subject is being dealt with there? Spiritual gifts. Yes. <clears throat> and that's another big topic that when we get there um, will be great for us to, to get some handles on. In chapter 15, there's like two different topics that are discussed there. Starts out with a definition of what? Grace. Um, it is uh, grace, but specifically he says a different word. Starts with the same letter. <laughs> what has he preached to them? The gospel. Yes. So he's talking about the gospel. And he also talks about what resurrection. the resurrection. Right. Apparently, these have been things that have been asked of him, and he needed to give them clarity. And then in chapter 16, what is chapter 16 basically about? collection money collection yeah the collection for the saints and as paul tends to do in the final chapter he does greetings he does um instructions on specifics like bring this to me take that uh talks about people a lot of times so it's kind of a concluding um statement he doesn't necessarily do a benediction in this one as he does um, in a lot of them, but the, it's kind of bringing things together. But the main topic he talks about in that is the collection for the saints. So this is just a really fast way of going through this book and putting those things down and just saying, oh, this these chapters are about this. Oh, these chapters are about that. And being able to glance at it. Now, traditions might be one that you're going to have to maybe fine tune a little bit and say, what specifically are we talking about there? Because that one's a little more vague. But that's a huge overview of the book and segment divisions. It's fascinating to me whenever I study a book to see that a book is laid out. 
I mean, we have a tendency to just read it and just go from one thing to the next, but there's order to this. There's thought process. Remember, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for training in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God is equipped and, and adequate for every good work. So Paul has a purpose given to him by God, given the words by God, and he's dealing with specifics with a group of people. And does this have anything to do with us? Did you find this to be relevant to today? Yeah. And I think as we get deeper, we're going to see that more and more. I mean, Sandy said it early on. It, she read it and was like, this sounds like what we need to be hearing in church today. <laughs> you know, this is what we need to be talking about. Um, so as we continue on and as we look at, we're just going to look at the titles for the first six chapters. That's all she took you through. But as, just so you know, as we get further into the study and in coming weeks, when we get to chapter seven, eight, et cetera, you're going to start putting, filling that part in as well. But for now, we're just going to look at these first six uh, chapters to get their titles. So in the first chapter, um, what specifically is he dealing with? Thinking in terms of, remember we're in the section that has to do with problems reported. So it would fit into that category and even the topics that we mentioned or the problems that we mentioned. So what's, what did you think chapter one is about? An appeal for unity. Definitely an appeal for unity because what in the opposite is happening? What problem, what problem is he dealing with? Divisions, quarreling, and boasting. Yes. So the problem is divisions. And that division is, I heard somebody say it, they're boasting, right, in different men. Which leads to those divisions. And instead, they need to be boasting in what? Jesus, the gospel. Yes. And I'm going to say absolutely for both of those, but I'm just going to say God's wisdom because that wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. So instead of boasting in individual men, they need to be boasting in because these men are good men. So that's not the problem. The men aren't the problem. It's that they're aligning themselves under a certain guy and I'm in somebody's camp and you're in that camp and that's causing divisions. Because obviously, if I want to be of Paul's camp and you're of Apollos' camp, then you think your guy's better than my guy, and I think my guy's better than your guy. And that's just causing problems. And it's totally unnecessary. And Paul is saying, if there's any wisdom, the wisdom's from God. If any of us are speaking wisdom, it's from God. Boast in that. Boast in God's wisdom. Don't boast in men's wisdom. So that's the deal. There's more to it. You'll go into more next week, but that's the overall theme or is a way of putting the overall theme of chapter one. Now, what about chapter two? Paul says of these, this group that they're Christians and they're not lacking in anything in their Christianity. They had received God's grace and they'd been taught by these wonderful godly teachers, right? Um, the problem, as we've already stated in chapter one, is they're boasting in men. Um, and then as we go into chapter two, um, it says he uses himself twice as an illustration of God's wisdom, you know, his teaching God's wisdom. And he's saying, Paul, talking about himself, see, Apollos was known as a powerful preach teacher. Paul says of himself, I didn't preach in cleverness of speech. Um, I did it. The wisdom I have, if it's eloquent at all, is because it's God's. And I'm just that person that's speaking it. As he continues, and he said that in, in chapter one, and, and as he continues in two, he says his preaching was a demonstration of what? God's power. God's power. God's power through the Holy Spirit empowering him. And, and it wasn't, again, it was not because he had 
the perfect words, the persuasive words, or that he had words that you would understand, plausible words of wisdom. He didn't have that. Um, I don't know if he was like a horrible public speaker because <laughs> he doesn't describe himself as a great public speaker. Um, obviously, we know he, you know, the reach and, and where all he went and what stayed behind behind him, but he always points it back to if there's any effectiveness, it's not him. He was just being used and he was the person and he was faithful and, and, and contributed, but the Holy Spirit is where the power is. He's speaking to this partly because there are people that have come in and have tried to talk him down, right? And he even says, um, trying to think of, you know, he's saying his preaching that I was trying to think, see where it is that he basically says, when I come, we'll see where the power is. Words are great. You know, I could, I could compose a really wonderful statement and message. You could be completely impressed, but if God is not behind it, you're not going to remember it. It's not going to be worth remembering. Um, I, and I hope I don't, step on anybody's toes here, but years ago, more than 20 years ago, um, the message was a supposed translation. It's really not a translation. It's a paraphrase came out and people were raving about it. They loved it. It was in our common language. It was more readable and I would read it and I couldn't get anything out of it. I even would read it thinking I got it and thought, well, I'll read this to my children when we homeschooled because it will be more on, you know, conversational level, like they would understand and they weren't getting anything out of it. Nothing. We went right back to our, I, we, I like the NAS. We went right back to the NAS and they got it and I got it and we could retain it. And I really came to the conclusion because this is a, translation, not the original language, but it's a translation from the original language that was carefully translated, where the message is a paraphrase. It's literally me saying, in other words, and my words aren't, they don't matter. My words, only if they come from God, matter, and I mean straight from the word. So that's just an illustration of there isn't any power in the, in other words. <laughs> there's power, sometimes we do need to stop and say, well, how, how else could we think of this? And in other words, okay, so in chapter two, um, we see Paul saying, it's not me, it's not my persuasive words, it's not that I'm good at this, it's not that anybody, any of these godly men are good at this. God reveals his wisdom, how? Through the Holy Spirit. Yes. God reveals his wisdom through the Holy Spirit or through his spirit. In chapter three, he's dealing with a problem we've mentioned before in a description of who they are and what is Paul saying about them? What is the problem that he's addressing in chapter three? Where are they in this? Immaturity. Yes, immaturity, infants even, right? He says that he has to give them milk. He can't send them off to solid food yet. For those of you who probably everybody, just about everybody here has ever dealt with a baby, you know, we know we start them on milk. That's all they need. It's perfect for them. They seriously can't handle anything more. And you usually don't introduce food for many, many months. Um, cause they're just, their digestive systems aren't ready for it and they don't need it. And it can lead to more allergies and things as we know now, um, because they're infants, what kinds of things are they dealing with? What are some of the issues? Jealousy, right? Jealousy, jealousy and strife. Jealousy and strife, right. And instead, they need to be built up and they need to build on Christ. Kind of the solution to the problem. 
Um, whenever Paul says you're still on milk, that is something that was needed, but you need to move up, move on. You're not going to mature if you, if you and I and all of us here were still drinking only mother's milk, would we be healthy? Would we be able to be the age we are? No, we would not be healthy anymore. That's what's needed in the beginning, but that's not what you need pretty quickly after. You should be cutting your teeth and you should be on solid food. So you, there's a, a process. The fact that they're infants still means that there's this jealousy and strife going on that immaturity is showing, but instead they need to build on Christ. Okay, and in chapter four, Still, we're in the part about boasting in men, how he needs to correct this and how it's led to divisions. What's he dealing with in chapter four? Judgment. I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that. I'm sorry, judgment, they were judging. Okay, judge. they're judging, um, okay, and would be an a outcome of that um, infancy and jealousy. Um, Arrogance. Yes. So he's telling them don't be, right? Don't be arrogant or boast. And he says, in this case, not just about men, he names two different categories, like what he is, what all these other people are. He says there are two, there's two S words. He calls them himself and those that are working. He calls them what two things? Servants and stewards. Yes. Servants and stewards. And if you have the attitude and mentality of either a servant or a steward, and we're going to go in to detail when we get to this chapter of what each of those categories are, but we have an idea of what they are. Both of them are workers. They're under some authority. They're doing a specific task for a reason. And that's not a reason to boast. And that's not a reason to be arrogant. And in this case, it's not a reason to grab onto one of those and boast about them and be arrogant about them. They're doing their job. That's not what you're supposed to be about um, and not be careful. And um, I mean, we can all fall into this, uh, whether, I mean, we have denominations <laughs> for a reason. Some of it's good, not all of it's bad, and I'm not stepping on anybody's toes because not all anybody here can possibly go to every church out there. That's not how it works. You know, we pick, we choose, there's reasons, hopefully good ones. Um, but some of the reasons behind denominations are that you've got a, a splitting of ways, uh, difference in thinking, teaching, or whatever, um, but it can lead to people saying, mine is better. You know, yours is not as good as mine. It can. It doesn't necessarily have to. Or you can get away from denominations and you can get to, um, you know, how many times people come to preset ministries and literally say, I just want to sit at the feet of Kay. <laughs> and all the people there that know Kay and know what she's like. And it's really hard not to think very highly of Kay because, you know, she, she's worthy of, of some honor. But they always say, well, put on your running shoes because she rarely sits still. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be able to sit for long because she's on the move. And of course, their, their, their uh, thought is that they're coming to learn from her. But Kay's not looking for worship. She's looking to point you back to the word and back to God. And if she can be used to do that, great. Uh, but, you know, she didn't start out to make a name for herself. That wasn't, it just, it, God made it happen. So we all need to be careful of this. We all need to be careful that we don't think that our little piece of the pie is the best one. <laughs> and if you want to be glad you are where you are, I'm all for that. Um, just be careful that you're not, you know, in judgment, as we said before, of someone else and whatever their choice is. But just everybody, somebody's got to go somewhere. And that's what we need to be glad about. <clears throat> 
Okay, in chapter five, there's a very specific topic and problem that's being talked about there. We've already talked about it in our broader topics and what is what's being dealt with in chapter five. Disorder in the church, immorality. Immorality, yes. Um, and specifically, are surrounding one person, a man. What is the solution to this problem? Get rid of him. Remove the uh, wicked. From yeah, the that's yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. Remove the wicked one. And as I've said before, and we'll say it over and over, we will study this further when we get to that chapter. It is one that if you've been with me for five seconds, you know I quote this chapter a lot um, for several different reasons. It's a very, it's a short chapter and it's powerful. Um, and it is something I will say the church needs to be listening to. They're not doing a good job here. But again, before we move on, it's not our hope and our goal to find people and kick them out of church. But sometimes it's needed. What is the goal? The goal is for them to restore. The goal is for them to see their wickedness and to restore. And remember, it's here very clearly said, we're talking about within the church. We're not talking about the world. The world is going to act like the world. We used to be one of them. We know what that's like. The world's going to act like the world. But once you get saved, once you call yourself a Christian and are within a body of believers or just calling yourself a Christian, you need to start acting like it. And that's not something that can be tolerated. And we'll go into that when we get into it further, but this is not something that's going on in most churches very well. And in chapter six, what is the problem being dealt with there? Uh, legal cases. Yes, the lawsuits. Yes. And again, he's talking about lawsuits within the church. Believers should not be, that that could be and should be handled in a different way. There can be problems. He's not saying don't ever, you know, do anything about it, but there's a way, and that we would want Christians to be looking at our situations and helping us discern and helping us, rather than going to people that aren't Christians and putting our hands, putting ourselves in their hands, and putting our fate in their hands, which is not good. He tells them also, again, talking about immorality, to flee immorality, and ultimately, there to glorify God, right? And one of the, when I was doing my at a glance chart, I added some extra lines in because I don't always use those extra spaces, but instead of just having a big uh, blank, I um, sometimes will go ahead and divide it up. So one of the things that you can say about a major division of one to six, and it's very similar to what Sandy Black said earlier, which was that the first is about grace and sanctification. I'm just gonna put it a little differently and I'm just gonna say glorify God in your body. And it's just another concluding statement or segment <clears throat> that's being discussed there. Now, that is looking at those first six. We could go on through the, set, the 16, but again, when we get to those chapters, we're going to start doing a little bit more of that, but we wanted to first look at these major divisions. We just handled the first major division, which are the problems that have been reported to Paul, that Paul is talking about and dealing with. And these are major problems. And these are problems similar to problems today. So it's very relevant. The second part are the specific questions they had written to him about, specific topics that they asked him about. And so he's writing in response to that to address it. 
He says he intends to come to see them again. He wanted Apollos to come back and Apollos wasn't at that time ready to go back. So all of this is part of the historical context. If you uh, study Paul's life and kind of know where this would fit, we're not setting dates. That's not really our goal, but it helps tremendously to understand when this time frame this was written, what types of things that the people were dealing with, and that's what comes out and starts coming more and more and more to the surface. Again, the most broad thing is this is a letter written from Paul to a group of people, the Corinthians. As you go a little deeper, you learn a little bit more about the Corinthians and their relationship with Paul. The fact that he'd already been there, the fact that he hadn't gone back yet, the fact that he's somewhere else and he's writing to them and that we get that preserved for us to read, which is awesome. Um, and you continue on, you see a little bit more of the details, but not, not huge detail yet. As we start next week, you're gonna do a chapter study of chapter one and you will go, you'll slow down. And that's the beauty of Bible study is not just reading it, which is awesome and is a great discipline because that gives you an overall perspective of the Bible and a familiarity with its topics and a familiarity with God and his ways. But Bible study causes you to stop and go deep. And that's what we're doing is in Bible study. But even in this lesson, this is more broad and big and fast. Um, is there anything that anybody, well, we haven't done the book theme. So as we think about these chapters, and remember we haven't really finished all of the chapter titles yet, but we have the broad categories and major, major divisions. As you think about this book as a whole, um, there are some topics that have already come up that would really fit, but we wanna make sure that all of our topics, all I'm sorry, all of our book chapter titles would fit under the umbrella of our book theme. Because for instance, if I gave a book theme of, um, there's a market in downtown Corinth and it sells baked goods. And that's our overall theme. That's nowhere near, that's nowhere in the book. <laughs> and fleeing immorality doesn't fit. <laughs> you know, so sometimes we, as we look at a book at a whole, if you were doing this on your own and you took a book that you just particularly wanted to study and weren't using one of the precept workbooks that are have written almost every book uh, for every book, then you might just be looking at this and saying, oh, I think this is what the, the chapters are about. But then it would come to the surface what the whole book was about. And you'd go back and look at one of your chapter titles and say that really doesn't fit the overall theme. I might need to tweak that. But again, it's not about being perfect and it's not about being right. But as we look at all of the book, let's think about some of these topics, some of these segment divisions and come up with what overall is Paul trying to present when he's talking about. Now he's using problems, he's using topics, he's using the fact that he's had things reported and he's had things written to him, okay? That's not really the book theme, but from all of that, I'm gonna say there's like two, in my opinion, there's like two major ideas that aren't exclusive of each other that I would use as the theme for this book. And I like to use the words that are in the, in the book. So what, you give me some ideas of things that you've thought of that you would summarize the book about, if you're willing to put yourself out there. Well, I can't. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I, uh, one is just kind of obvious from what we've already said that uh, problems and their solutions. Okay. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Yep. Okay. Because it's good to have solutions and not just be talking about problems, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to put down here some of our ideas. These are not the chapter themes down here. And you know, this is a joke, sorry. So some of you don't know me, but I was gonna say doctrine is decided by popular vote. No, it is not, but <laughs> we're gonna put some ideas up here and we're gonna kind of come together. So you said problems and solutions, right? Okay, anything else? 
So since they're babies, he's educating them. Okay. Can we say growing them up? Sure. Okay. And so I'll, I'll put your educating on here. I like that because obviously Paul is, is teaching. I mean, that's what he does. Um, educating and then I will say grow them up. He, he has identified that they need to grow up. He's identified that they're they're infants. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else? It was actually something you said earlier, Sandy Fankhauser. Um, we've got several Sandys in this group, but I'll try to <laughs> send you F. Um, you said earlier, and it was actually in one of these chapters that they were to have what kind of the because of the divisions, it was the opposite of divisions. Do you remember what you said? Unity. Right. Unity. Unity. Okay. And very specifically, they were to be of one mind. And one mind in particular, whose is that? Jesus Christ. Right. So all of that kind of goes together. It's just kind of a flow of thought that unity is the opposite of division, which is what they had. This is a solution that we were talking about earlier. And, and, and he wanted them to be of like mind. He wanted them to be of one mind, to come together rather than fractured and split apart and divided. And specifically that we can have the mind of Christ. And that is certainly a goal. Okay. Um, what else? Anybody else? Many of these things are dealing with these topics and these problems are dealing with obviously the body of the believers, but they're talking about the individual. They're talking about marriage, being married, staying married, not staying married, being a virgin, not being a virgin. They're talking about a person fleeing immorality, not being in immorality, not eating food sacrificed to idols, not having lawsuits outside the church, talking about the spiritual gifts that the individual has and collectively they have as a church. They're not lacking in any gift. That doesn't mean the individual has every spiritual gift. It's all of the individuals put together, that church does not lack any spiritual gift, which is probably true of any body of believers in good. God would place those body, those in there. He talks about the gospel and resurrection, and obviously that's important to each of, what, of us in collection for the saints. I'm just looking at the topics. So I'm just trying to get to basically this, this statement I said as a major division, that we're to glorify God in our bodies or through our lives. So I'm going to put that up there. And he, he specifically means, because he says immorality is the one sin that we do in, in, in ourselves. All other sins are outside of our bodies. So it is very specific to literally this temple that, I, that the Holy Spirit's in. And as I had a pastor once say, the temple used to be, you know, a building. And I'm just reading about that in Second Chronicles. Solomon just dedicated the temple. It was literally a building. And he even said, it cannot possibly contain you, God. It can't contain you. Yet God showed up and the thick cloud filled it and the Shekinah glory would be over it. He gave a visual presence as well. But now that building stayed in one place and people had to go to it. Or as Solomon said, if we're in another place, we look towards it and we reach out, stretch out our hands to it as we pray and as we give our supplications. So that was a, a specific in a spot. Now we're told we are the temple. This shell, this earth suit that God gave me contains now the Holy Spirit. Yours does too. Yours does too. You know, everybody on here, yours do. We are a temple without walls. We get to walk out into the world and take the Holy Spirit with us now. We don't drag a body into a building and say, now you're in the presence of God. 
So it's, it's an awesome concept. So again, glorifying God in our bodies is really important. And living this out in the world is very important. So um, sorry, I sermonized a little bit. Um, anyway, so we're getting back to our thing. And these are great topics. We've got problems and solutions, educating or growing them up, unity, one mind, Christ mind, glorifying God in our bodies. Now, if we were to look at just these on here, if we looked at lawsuits, fleeing immorality, and glorifying God, or if we looked at infants, jealousy, strife, building on Christ, um, would all of these fit under one or two or three of these, you know, we're trying to keep it as, as, as concise as possible. But um, if you were to step back and say, this is what Paul is, is overall, he's dealing with problems, he's dealing with topics, he's giving them solutions. Absolutely. He's absolutely doing those things. But in doing so, what is his goal for them? What is his hope for them? And you can pick from some of this. <laughs> I'm kind of guiding you in a direction I want you to go. Any, of, any of these are good. Go ahead. Growing in Christ. Okay. Growing in Christ. Um, I'm a, okay. I had grow them up. So we're going to kind of, you're going to say, okay, you're going to say grow in Christ. They've started, they need to continue, and they need to, to go beyond where they are. Um, I'm going to say have the mind of Christ. And glorify God. Well, chapter 6, verse 20 says it all, doesn't it? You've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. I definitely think glorify God in your body is part of it, absolutely. And I believe because of the divisions and I believe because of the problems and I believe because of the jealousy and strife and because of their infants in Christ, they have not moved beyond that, that, that having that mind of Christ is, is definitely a goal. Yeah, and I think therefore it gives a pretty good overarching idea. So between having the mind of Christ and glorifying your God, God in your body, I think that pretty much covers this book, growing up in Christ, uh, problems and solutions, all of these are good. So they're not bad. And if that's what, and then really problems and solutions is great because that's what technically this book is about point by point. Um, and if that is what you would glance at and know what first Corinthians is about, keep it. That's yours. That's great. Um, for me, I'm going to stick with the mind of Christ and glorifying God in my body um, because that's body, mind, and soul. And I, I think that's just something I have learned in my life that God has made us uh, up of God, body, mind, and soul. And while I'm on this earth, I've got this body. Later, I'll have a better one. Um, and while I'm on this earth, I am to be glorifying God in my body. But having the mind of Christ is something that helps me with that. So that is, we're going to stop. We're really at the end of our time. And um, for those, again, who haven't done this before, we will stop now. I'll pray. I'll stop the recording. I'll come back when I start the K. Arthur lecture. You're welcome to stay. It's not going to hurt my feelings if you leave. Um, and like I said earlier, if you come late, if I can see you and I admit you, um, you're not bothering anybody. So <laughs> don't worry. I'd rather you come five, 10 minutes late or even 15 minutes late than not come at all. Um, I also do give a text reminder at 30 minutes before if you want that to remind you of the time and find the Zoom link more easily. You just have to let me know and give me a phone number for that. Okay, so we're going to end in prayer and then take a break. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, it is a daunting task to look at a book as a whole and to really feel like we have any handle on it because at this point in an overview we rarely do but then it's awesome to come through it and realize that we do have a better handle on this a better uh, understanding even at the surface level even at the most obvious level of this book and you've given us that and you've given it through coming together and bringing up the topics and and helping bring it together through study 
that's the beauty of, of the discussion. We uh, welcome what Kay has to say in the lecture in the next part and just ask that you will take us through this next week and help us as we do our homework to, to be diligent and stay on task and come back prepared to take what we've learned and just bring it together and have a better understanding of it. We thank you for all of this. I thank you for the ministry that we have in this that I, I get to participate in and the ladies that show up. I thank you for all of it and ask you for all of it in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen. I want to welcome Janie because Janie was my next door neighbor when I was born. <laughs> her parents were dear, dear, dear friends of mine, and I'm just so excited to have her on here. So anyway, thank you. Hi, Janie. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye.